introduce you. Um, so, so hi, I'm Rob Greenbaum. Welcome back to the pseudo in person colloquium series. We have a small group here in the LEC, and, and hopefully a larger group online. We're, we're thrilled to be um, partially back in person again. Um, those of you online, please feel free to type in your, your questions via the chat, and we'll make sure we do have some time. So today, we're, we're pleased to, to welcome uh, Professor Daniel Gingrich. He's an assistant professor with appointments in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geotic, Geotic Engineering, the Department of Integrated Systems Engineering. Um, he's a core faculty member of the Sustainability Institute at Ohio State University, which is a very interdisciplinary group of faculty. Um, Dr. Gingrich um, received his PhD from the um, program of the Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Those of you who are at Mike Takei's colloquium presentation a few weeks ago, that's um, one of the departments Mike was in when he was a faculty member at, at Carnegie Mellon. So we're sort of continuing the, the tradition here. At Ohio State, his research is focused on modeling the performance, cost, and environmental impact of existing and emerging technologies designed to make our water, energy, and material systems more sustainable and resilient. And today, he will be talking about modeling technology for the design of clean water and safe drinking water regulations. He said he does not mind to get interrupted. So if you have um, chat questions, we can relay them to him. Those of you in the audience, you're all his students, so feel free to interrupt him as well. He does that to you, I'm sure. Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Today. All right. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm pleased to be over here in Glenn and Paige Hall and having across the Oval from Engineering. Um, and as Professor Greenbaum mentioned, today I'm going to talk about modeling technology for the design of clean water and safe drinking water regulations. And I use the phrase clean water and safe drinking water deliberately because these are the two key pieces of federal water legislation here in the United States. Yeah. Um, the Clean Water Act is the authorizing legislation that charges the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA to regulate wastewater discharges and maintain the environmental quality of the nation's waters. Whereas the Safe Drinking Water Act is the piece of legislation that charges the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate drinking water quality and provides oversight into water utilities in several aspects. Like a lot of environmental regulations, there are particular challenges that face the EPA when they are making regulations. Um, while these challenges might be broad and apply to many types of environmental regulations, they do not, they have some unique flavors for water. For instance, we can think about three notable challenges that I want to highlight today. First, there's just a lack of data on, especially real-time data, on environmental water, and in particular, compounds of interest in that water. We don't have inline sensors in order to detect toxic metals like mercury or arsenic in our environmental water bodies. And so someone actually has to go out and physically grab a sample of water and then take it to a lab where it's tested, oftentimes several hours or days later. Similarly, water can also be highly variable, even in areas that are geographic proximal to each other, such as this particular picture. This is one of my favorite ways to highlight this phenomenon. This is the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers at Point State Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You've got the Allegheny River. It is the river to the north. Um, so at the top, it is the clear water, whereas the Monongahela is a dirtier water. When they come together at Point State Park to form the Ohio rivers, you see kind of this separation and distinction of water, even when it's right next to each other. And that means contains kind of the separation of the water qualities for, um, for a little bit longer into the Ohio River. And it's not just kind of dramatic examples like this that are a problem for water quality. It also can impact a matter um, for drinking water utilities that might be within the same county, but on other sides of the county. So one drinking water utility may get their water from an underground aquifer. And that underground water aquifer that they are pulling from can have very different water qualities than the surface water facility on another side of the county. And then finally, it can also be challenging to assess the costs to treat water and the benefits of improving water quality. Um, there are a whole host of technical challenges around how you assess the costs of emerging technologies, as well as how you track environmental quality improvements. And for water quality regulations, they not only have to undergo a benefit cost analysis, but they have to pass a benefit cost analysis, which makes being able to track and assess and understand what these costs and benefits are critical in promulgating the regulations. Now, what I'm going to talk today is about how modeling can be used to fill these data gaps. In particular, I'm going to talk about how modeling can fill data gaps and, in particular, identify places where data would be most useful to fill gaps when it comes to the design of regulations. 
less than week critical when we start to think about how water can be used to promulgate or models can be used to promulgate and understand the variation in water based on the technical and environmental processes and reactions that water is undergoing. And then we'll also look at an example of how to model the cost of water treatment technologies and how that can feed into the design of regulations um, when you're thinking about benefits and cost ratios, as well as what is an acceptable cost for water treatment technologies. To look at these three uses for modeling and water treatment applications, I'm going to talk about three different case studies, both around the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And the Clean Water Act, when we the first case study is going to look at power plants and power generation sector. And when you think about clean water and water pollution at power plants, it is inextricably tied with the Clean Air Act and how we regulate the pollution discharges of air pollutants. And so we're going to look and try to understand how modeling help us uh, assess how the Clean Act amendments change trace amount behavior at coal fired power plants and how that impacts water quality as a result. We'll also use the same models to understand how fuel gas desulfurization, wastewater, this is one of the, the major wastewater streams produced at coal fired power plants. How we can use models to understand trace element concentrations in the absence of large scale data monitoring campaigns. And then shifting gears, we'll also under, try to understand the Safe Drinking Water Act. And in particular, how um, drinking water regulations and the cost of compliance with drinking water regulations can stress the financial capabilities of water utility systems. And so not to throw away much of the punchline, but just uh, the findings that we're going to see throughout this talk and that you'll see as we move forward, is that when it comes to the interactions between the Clean Air Act amendments and wastewater discharges, the Clean Air Act amendments reduce trace element flows to gaseous and solid phases. So reduce the amount of mercury, arsenic, and selenium that ended up in atmospheric flows. So it was discharged in the exhaust gas of power plants and found, or found its way into fly ash and bottom ash but it led to an increase in the amount of these trace out elements that ended up in wastewater. Because it led to an amount, or an increase in the amount of trace elements ending up in wastewater, we're well, going to see it. The formatting is a bit different, I got messed up. Um, sorry, it does not look as pretty uh, right now, but it's going to see that there'll, there'll be substantial variations in the presence and concentration of these trace elements in wastewater, potentially enough to justify differentiated clean water act regulations that are economic efficiency. And then on the Safe Drinking Water Act side, we'll find and see that small and very small systems may lack the financial capabilities in order to pay for centralized PFAS compliance technologies. You may have heard of these PFAS chemicals, they are what are known as the forever chemicals, and there's a lot of regulatory action on them right now. But let's dive in to these first two case studies looking at power plants in the power generation sector, the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts. And at a high level, I want to start off actually by giving a bit of regulatory history about how wastewater has been regulated at these power plants. And following the initial passage of the Clean Water Act, starting in 1974 and then several times throughout the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency promulgated and updated regulations on the discharge of certain water streams from power plants. These regulations are known as effluent limitation guidelines, and they set maximum standards for how much can be discharged at any given time. In 1982, the EPA promulgated its first rules looking at flue gas desulfurization wastewater, but it classified it as a low volume waste stream, which meant that it had different standards in terms of what it was actually looking at. It was looking at what is known as the conventional water flutes, things like total suspended solids, the pH of the water, its temperature, the oil and grease content of that water, those types of things, which carried on for several decades. Critically, though, in the 1990s, Congress passed the 1990 Clean Act Amendments. The EPA promulgated several rules. These rules uh, drove the adoption of the gas desulfurization system. So what was classified as a low volume waste stream in the 1982 uh, regulation may not have been sufficient. And there was not coordination between these two different offices within the EPA. And so we go from 1982 to 2015, when we see the EPA promulgate updated ethical limitation guidelines looking at flue gas desulfurization wastewater discharges. And these regulations are going to look at the trace elements and toxic metals of concern within flue gas desulfurization wastewater. So the EPA will set standards on arsenic, mercury, and selenium in particular. And then these rules are still currently being discussed. So for instance, in uh, 2020, the EPA promulgated a supplementary ruling on flue gas desulfurization wastewater discharge. And then for some reason that no one quite understands, a year later, uh, 
no possible reason, no possible explanation could exist for why the EPA decided they wanted to revise that rule that was promulgated in 2020. Um, but these rules are still, even the 2020, 2021 supplementary rulings are going to be looking at trace element behavior in coal fired power plants, the behavior of trace metals. And trace metal behavior in power plants has been well studied for decades. Starting in the 1970s, we see people going out to power plants and conducting mass balance studies to understand how these trace elements are moving through a power plant and how they are moving in response to air pollution control technologies that they installed in order to comply with things like the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. And what they've consistently found is that there are three broad categories of trace elements. And these trace elements can be categorized on the basis of their volatility. So for instance, we've got these group one trace elements, things like europium, pathophorium, manganese, and thorium, that are very high boiling point. In fact, their boiling points are so high that they're going to not volatilize in the combustion process. They're going to stay in the bottom ash of the power plant. And so they're going to remain in the solid phase throughout the process. And there are these group two trace elements, things like arsenic, cadmium, and lead. These ones have a boiling point that is sufficient to volatilize, to be released into the exhaust gas of the combustion process, but are likely to condense onto particulate matter as they move throughout the power plant process. And then because they condense onto particulate matter, they tend to be removed when we remove particulate matter from air pollution control systems. And so these medium boiling point elements tend to end up in the solid waste of a power generation process. And then there's these low boiling point elements, in particular the halides of bromine, chlorine, and fluorine, as well as mercury. These ones also will volatilize, will end up in the exhaust gas, the combustion gases, but they are less likely to condense onto particulate matter and therefore either tend to be removed in the scrubbing process, like a wet flue gas desulfurization process, or not removed at all without other treatment steps. And so because we have this consistent behavior, we can use this information in order to understand how are these trace elements going to behave at power plants? And we can start to develop models that will predict trace element behavior at power plants. And that was the goal of this particular model that I built while I was a postdoc and then have continued to apply here at Ohio State for some work to understand the behavior of trace elements at power generation facilities. And this is the Coles controls model of the contaminant behavior of air, liquid, and solids. And these yellow boxes represent data sources into the fundamental models. We're using data from the US Geological Survey in terms of coal concentrations for trace elements, information from the Energy Information Administration in terms of where power plants find their coal from, and what air pollution control devices do they have installed, and then data from the peer-reviewed literature on the behavior of trace elements in power plants. So when we combine these data sources in order to figure out just how much, what is the total mass of arsenic, what is the total mass of mercury, what is the total mass of chlorides that enter coal-fired power plants every year across the United States. And it's not just the total at for all power plants, it's the total at any given power plant. Uh, and then there's also some information. Because we know what's installed at every power plant, we know how trace elements behave in power plants, we can start to predict the total amounts that are leaving power plants in the exhaust gas or that end up in the bottom and fly ash of power plants or in the uh, flue gas desulfurization waste water used. There is uncertainty and variability in all of these things, and we are characterizing that in a gloss over for that, but I'm happy to take questions in terms of how we actually capture and propagate, propagate that uncertainty throughout our model. Um, just know that we've got some Monte Carlo analysis built in there in order to understand and account for that. And then once we know how much is entering the liquid phase, how much is ending up in wastewater, we can do some other work to figure out the concentration of the wastewater. And to do that, what we're going to do is going to take some information from the Electric Power Research Institute and the Utility Water Act Group. These are regulatory bodies within the power sector, or not regulatory bodies, um, research and advocacy groups within the power sector. And they have guidance in terms of just how much chloride should be in flue gas desulfurization wastewater to avoid corroding your system. And if we know the allowable concentrations of chloride and we know the total mass of chloride, we can back calculate or at least back estimate the amount of wastewater produced because there's just no data out there in terms of wastewater production at power plants for this sector and this particular stream. Once we know wastewater volume and the mass of our other trace elements, we can then figure out the concentration of these trace elements. So we can figure out what is the concentration of mercury, arsenic, selenium, uh, lead and bromine in wastewater at power plants here in the United States. And then we're also going to work to validate this by modeling and comparing our estimates to data that was collected by the Eastern Research Group to support the environmental protection agency's regulatory activities on the DLGs. 
And so using this model, we can then understand and tease apart how compliance with the 1990 Act amendments impacted the flow of trace elements to the liquid phase into wastewater. And what we see is that the 1990 Clean Air Act Amendment compliance strategies led to an overall increase in the amount of these trace elements ending up in coal fired power plant wastewater. On the y axis, we've got the percent change in liquid phase from 1994 to 2017. So 1994 is when power plants started reporting compliance with the Clean Air Act Amendments. Um, and then we look for the, the following 24 years of data. And over this time period, there are three different things that happened that power plants chose to do or could have done in order to comply with regulations and respond to other market pressures. So for instance, over this time period, we see a very small decrease in the amount of coal that is consumed at power plants. And so that tiny blue bar represents a decrease in the amount of RTS elements that can be attributed to just reductions in burning coal across the fleet. Power plants also, in response to the 1990 Clean Air Act though, shifted where they were getting their coals from. They were shifting away from the high sulfur coals of the Appalachian Basin and towards lower sulfur coals in the Powder River Basin of Wyoming and the Rocky Mountain West. And these different coals not only had different concentrations of sulfur, but they also had different concentrations in trace elements. They had less selenium, less arsenic, less lead, less mercury, less chloride than their Appalachian counterparts. And then we see that power plants also installed new technologies into their air into their power plant systems. And these new technologies, these things like flue gas desulfurization, are going to change the partitioning behavior of power plants, or partitioning behavior of these trace elements. And in all cases except for bromide, the change of partitioning, the change in having wet flue gas desulfurization processes increased the flow rate to wastewater more than the decrease in concentration that we saw. And so for five of these six trace elements, we see a substantial increase in the amount of them entering into coal fired power plants over the period from 1994 to 2017. Um, there are some other complications that go on with bromine that we are not accounting for in this analysis. So for instance, one of the ways that power plants comply potentially with mercury standards is by using brominated coals, which bromine is just applied to the coal. Um, we don't take into account the impact of bromine addition to coals for um, flue gas mercury control in this analysis. And so what we see in this analysis is that clean air and clean water acts are inextricably tied and that modeling tools can be used in order to understand what is the impact of these regulations and understand how they cause the shift in power plant trace element flows. But as I said earlier, the model can also be used to predict concentrations of waste in wastewater at coal fire power plants. And so this is some of our validation work. This right now is for a particular power plant that the Eastern Research Group sampled at. This is Duke Energy's GG Allen plant located in North Carolina. And we've got four trace elements here, arsenic, mercury, lead, and selenium. And what we see in kind of the dark shaded boxes, those are our simulated data points. And the observed data points are the lighter shaded boxes. But the model seems to be capable of predicting concentrations to within an order of magnitude, which when you don't have data for it is still pretty good. And it can still be pretty useful for policy analysis. And if we look at some of the other samples that the Eastern Research Group collected, we see some pretty similar behavior in terms of our ability to predict. Um, the one exception is Wisconsin Electric Power, Wisconsin Electric Power's Pleasant Prairie facility, um, where we are off in terms of selenium and our uh, mercury concentrations. We're just not able to capture either the expected tendencies or the variations that were observed. And so as I've said a couple times in this presentation already, we can do this not just at the level of individual power plants or for a specific power plant, but we can apply this over the entire power plant fleet. And that's what this, these CDFs are showing us, the concentrations of arsenic, mercury, lead, and selenium across the power plant fleet. So each location is an individual. Each uh, power plant is an individual point on these CDFs. And we can see that there are pretty substantial variations, although um, mercury tends to be at a lower concentration on the order of about a tenth of a milligram per liter, as opposed to the multi tenths of a milligram per liter or full milligram per liters that might see for things like arsenic, lead, and selenium. But we see some pretty substantial variations across the fleet as well. And so, if you want to think about variations across the fleet, we can break out these CBS and look at them individually. And then we can also start to characterize not just the 
interplant variability, the variability between plants, and the variability within plants that we might observe. And so that's what this CDF is starting to get at, is our flea white concentrations in 2017. Um, this particular one is for mercury. So on the x-axis, we've got 0 0.01 milligrams per liter all the way to a full one milligram per liter. And the y-axis is the cumulative probability. And so we can see that it, we might reasonably expect mercury concentrations at coal-fired power plants across the United States to vary by about a degree, order and a half of magnitude. The dashed lines also represent interplant variability. And so they represent the uh, 50th percentile confidence interval for what we'd expect concentrations to look like for these trace elements. I've also plotted those three plans I showed you earlier, so you can see kind of how our predicted concentrations line up to what was observed. And so you'll see that we're again kind of able to characterize the variability for mercury for most of the power plants, except for Dickerson, where there's slightly higher um, expect, uh, observed ranges in the concentration. So that was mercury. We can do similar analysis for other trace elements like arsenic, which I've got here. Um, again, kind of we see that same five orders of magnitude in terms of concentration difference across the fleet with our three plants lined up and showing pretty good agreement in terms of what was observed and what we predict for the variability. And so while we might have a five order of magnitude difference between plants, there's also substantial inter or intra-plant variability. So for instance, this is some intraplant variability for mercury. On the, this is a, a kind of reversed human distribution function on the x-axis, you have the percent of plants. And then on the y-axis, you have the uh, 50th percentile of our predicted concentrations is the darker shaded region, and that lighter shaded region is the 90th percentile in terms of concentration. The y-axis, the, the units are orders of magnitude. So each tick mark indicates an order of magnitude. And what we see is that for mercury, the 50th percentile confidence interval for some plants can range by about an order of magnitude. And if you go all the way to the 90th percentile confidence interval, which is uh, something the EPA considers in their analysis, you're hitting closer to about two orders of magnitude for mercury. And we see similar significant intraplant variability in our other constituents as well for arsenic and selenium. But for arsenic, you get closer to about three and a half or four orders of magnitude in the most extreme cases. And this is a lot of variability for the EPA to consider. This is a challenge. And in particular, highly variable wastewater concentrations pose three particular challenges. The first is how does the EPA establish standards for highly variable wastewater? When you've got kind of four orders of magnitude within a, within a plant, how do you set that what is an allowable standard for that? is how do we identify best available technologies when you've got highly variable wastewater? So how is the EPA supposed to say, this is the technology that will work and the technology we're using to base our standard on? And then there are questions around monitoring and data collection programs to improve tools like this, or to at least improve compliance estimates. And before I dive into how a tool like this can be useful, I do want to quickly highlight what the EPA does in terms of considering variability. Um, so for instance, the EPA, when they set regulations like this, they set three different standards. One is a non-enforceable long-term average. This is the average that when you're designing the treatment system, you should be targeting for in terms of your performance. Because if you hit that long-term average, then you should be able to hit the two enforceable standards, which are is a monthly average and a daily maximum. And the EPA sets these three standards using four steps. So I'm going to kind of keep it at a very high level, but I'm happy to talk about how the EPA does this uh, in greater detail. Step one is that the, the EPA, or rather a contractor for the EPA, is going to go out and sample a bunch of power plants. Um, and they're going to develop distributions and observations in terms of what are these, in this case, 12 power plants that were used in order to design the ethyl limitation guidelines for power plant wastewater. What are their concentrations at these facilities? The EPA is going to use this data to fit and create distributions of data. So they'll be able to say, if these are the observed concentrations, we can then fit predict concentrations to these observations. Once you've got your fits, you can then calculate the expected and extreme concentration levels. So what is the median of these distributions across the plant? And then what is what they call um, the daily variability factor, or DVF, the monthly variability factor, which are functions of that expected concentration at every plant, as well as the, either the 95th or 99th percentile concentration. And from that, the EPA is going to build some meta distributions across these states and identify the long term average, as well as the daily maximum and monthly average limits. 
So this is how the EPA incorporates variability into the numerical standards they set. They also have one more tool that they use, which is regulatory subclasses. And so these are subclasses or types of facilities that are regulated that for economic efficiency reasons might need something else. So that might uh, not, it might not make full sense to regulate them and treat them as if they were normal plants, quote unquote. And in the 2020 revisions, the EPA established three such subclasses. These were the low utilization plants, so plants that utilize less than 10% of their capacity in a given year. A single high flow plant, which produces more than 4 million gallons of wastewater per day. And our units that are either retiring or fuel switching by the end of 2028. And so might not be producing wastewater from food gas desulfurization in the coal because they're moving to say natural gas. And we can use a model like this in order to understand and play around with other ways of thinking about regulatory subclasses. And what we'll see in kind of the next couple slides is that wastewater concentrations can vary across plants, burning, different rates of coal, and different installed air pollution control devices, possibly enough to justify separate subclasses. So for instance, if you think about the rank of coal combusted, so coal has primarily three different rings here in the United States that we burn, it's bituminous, sub-bituminous, and lignite coals. Lignite coals produce wastewater that on average are kind of expected to look and have a lower concentration for most of these trace elements. Lignite coals are the dashed lines on your figures, whereas the bituminous and sub-bituminous coals are the solid lines. Um, and so this is kind of our simulated concentrations for wastewater at a, a power plant that has a cold side electrostatic precipitator, wet flue gas desulfurization installed. And we can see that those limit plants, they tend to have and be closer to the axis, which means that they tend to have concentrations that are lower. You might expect them to have concentrations that are lower. And then we can do some similar analyses for air pollution control devices. And we can see, for instance, that if your power plant doesn't have an electrostatic precipitator or some uh, particular amount of control system, then your wastewater is expected to have higher concentrations of arsenic, selenium, and lead. And importantly, kind of these variations on the basis of coal rank and installed air pollution control dev devices are statistically significant. They're significantly different from each other. Um, which could open up space to sort of think about them differently because they wouldn't have different costs associated with treating wastewaters at higher concentrations or at lower concentrations. This does open up some uh, trickier or thornier cans of worms in which you don't want a power plant to switch fuels or turn off an air pollution control device in order to classify themselves into a less stringently controlled system. Um, and so the EPA might need to think cleverly in order to test their authority in certain ways to get away with locking power plants into particular regulations and particular standards at the time of complications that you can't just switch um, by turning something off. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about how we think about um, ethyl implementation guideline compliance and how we model technologies, because we also need to think about technologies differently for power plants. So for instance, for mercury, which is shown on the left in green, we need to remove about 99.9 to 99.99% of mercury in order to comply with regulations. But for arsenic, we need to remove everything from there are is a handful of plants that actually don't need to treat anything. The arsenic concentrations are predicted to be at a sufficient level, all the way down to 99.99%. And if we think about in particular arsenic, where we have some plants that are already in compliance without treating their water use water, for those that require 99.99%, what we see is that one technology is likely to be insufficient or undesirable for compliance. And this is true for two reasons. First, Overtreating water is expensive. If you have to, oh, if you have water that could be sufficiently treated with chemical precipitation, that's a fairly cheap process that's going to remove at least 90% of your arsenic. That might work, but if you're told by the EPA the best available technology is to evaporate that wastewater, that is a very expensive process. And so we need to think about how we incorporate variability and cost. And it's also the case that overtreating water may not actually have many environmental benefits, so particularly at coal fired power plants where the energy inputs in the treatment processes are going to have significant environmental consequences. And then some other stuff uh, that as a technologist I like to think about is how we design and test technology. So right now we often test technologies on a limited number of samples. You have a power plant nearby you, you go, you grab some grab samples and then you test it on those grab samples. And if your technology works, great, you assume it will work everywhere. But that is not the case because grab samples are insufficient to characterize variability in wastewater both within a plant and across a plant. 
And so models like this can be useful to develop test wastewaters, represent the wastewaters that account for that expected concentration and the variability we see. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about modeling to identify data collection needs. In particular, there's a need for better data to validate tools like this, and data needs to regulate more efficiently. When the data needs to regulate a tool like this, we need to update our understanding of concentrations of trace elements in coal. Um, the databases we use are several years old, in some cases, several decades. The last time some of those data points were collected. And so we need a better understanding. We also need a better understanding of the behavior of these trace metals in air pollution and wastewater treatment systems. And we need to design smarter monitoring and uh, mass balance studies, the ones that we use to come up with those air pollution control device uh, partitioning factors. We need consistency in them across studies and within fleets, design more studies that can be used to create representative and realistic partitioning. And also those data needs to regulate. We need better, more widespread monitoring of emissions. This is useful to fill a gap, but ideally you'd want ground truth numbers. Unfortunately for water, as I mentioned, there's no continuous emissions monitoring system for many of the trace elements, with the exception of mercury and air pollution control devices. The toxic release inventory is low resolution. This is the inventory the EPA um, produces on wastewater, uh, trace element discharges, but it's only at the poor or the yearly level. And there's no widespread monitoring of wastewater discharges across the United States from power plants. We don't have this data already that's made publicly available. And so that's going to wrap up this kind of looking at the Clean Water Act. So I'm now going to switch gears to talking about the Safe Drinking Water Act. And in particular, thinking about affordability. This is some preliminary data that was collected to support a proposal. Um, so this is still very much in, in, the, in progress research. I'm excited uh, to share it for the first time here. And when we think about affordability and drinking water affordability, there are two types that often get mentioned. It's probably what you thought of when I first said when we talk about water affordability, which is household water affordability. It's also a question on system level affordability. And so household affordability is, for instance, analysis like this um, came in the city of Columbus, which is just figuring out what is the water bill that households are paying versus some measure of household wealth, in this case, the median household income. And it represents your ability to pay for water and sewer services. But for system level affordability, this is important from a regulatory perspective because it's used by the EPA to understand the ability of a drinking water system to raise the financial resources necessary to comply with new regulations and installment technologies. This is also known as financial capability. And from a systems level perspective, water is particularly interesting when it comes to costs, in part because water treatment has significant economies of scale. So these are the EPA's estimates of what compliance with the arsenic regulation will run across households across a range of system drinking water sizes. So systems that serve less than 100 people and pay the most, on average, they were expected to pay about $327 per year. We can compare this to those households in the four largest systems that we need to comply with the arsenic rule, we need to do something to comply, which would have to pay less than a dollar per year in order to comply with water. And if you want to compare it to the average, the average cost the EPA expected was about $32 per year. And so to comply with the arsenic maximum containment level, the very smallest systems would need to pay about 10 times the average and 400 times what households in the largest systems would need to pay. And this isn't kind of some abstract only historical concern with the arsenic regulation from the early 2000s. Because as I already mentioned, the EPA is looking at regulating the PFAS compounds in drinking water. So PFAS checks the statutory requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act to necessitate environmental regulations. In part, they are a health risk to humans. They are widespread across the United States. So this is a map looking at concentrations of PFAS in uh, various environmental and drinking waters across the US. And they can be removed by treatment technologies. And so the EPA is already starting to look at drinking water regulations for PFAS compounds which means they're gonna to need to think about financial capability. And this is the metric the EPA uses. It's basically, what is this going to do to your water costs? So what is your current household water bill plus your treatment costs to comply with that new regulation divided by your median household income? And if this is less than 2.5%, then it will be, your system will be uh, financially capable of raising the, the money necessary to comply. 
to look at this equation a bit more, this is what we're going to do to actually develop some of these numbers and develop some of these estimates. So we're going to develop a stratified sample of water systems here in the state of Ohio. Um, I'm going, this is preliminary, so I'm going to show you the results we've got so far for small and large systems, so systems that serve between 500 and 3,300 people, and systems that serve between 10,000 and 100,000 people. I'm going to go out, I had some undergrads contact these utilities and say, what are your water rates right now? What's your water rate structure? We then combine this information with household water use data. These locations come up with us as the household water bill. On the cost of compliance side, we're going to look at the cost using EPA's own cost models to evaluate how much this one costs households to install two technologies, reverse osmosis membranes and granular activated carbon. And then once you know those household water costs, we can combine them to come up with a household water bill complying with one of these two technologies. I'm going to show you the results for RO. These are an upper bound estimate. Um, RO is a more expensive technology, but it's also the one that's most likely to achieve compliance with the activated carbon, which is more than it as a system. And then the information on household income will come from the American Community Survey in these locations in these water systems that we're sampling out. And then we're going to come up with our overall system financial capabilities. And so what we'll see, for instance, if we look at the current household water bills, is that if you look at small and large systems, there's not a lot of variation. So the y-axis here is the household water costs. I've just arranged this, the 60 sample or 60 systems in our sample um, on the basis of costs. So from smallest to lowest, or from lowest to highest. And what we see is that those small systems and the large systems, their median costs are actually fairly similar. The median for large systems is about $330 a year in terms of what those households pay. And the small systems is about $377 a year. Um, we might expect that in reality, there should be a greater difference in costs. Um, but the, the dirty truth, the, bitter, the dirty fact about water financing is that households don't actually pay the full cost of water. And that oftentimes these utilities are financed uh, through other means besides just rate paid, at least not financed directly by their rate payers. Um, instead, the rate payers pay other ways to like, do things like city taxes. It might subsidize water provision. So this is that first part. This is what are they paying now? This is what they might be expected to pay under compliance using membrane systems. And here we start to see a, a big difference. Um, before I dive into what that difference is, though, I do want to talk a little bit about the EPA cost levels and why we see such a big gap or a big difference in the small system estimates. So the EPA cost models have within their kind of system size classes, there are the, the five high level system size classes, but within those, there are also some smaller ones. So for instance, the small systems range from 500 to 3,300 within the cost models, the, the cost models themselves, you come up with an estimate for a system that's served between 500 and 1,000 and between 1,000 and 3,300. And so that discontinuity is more a reflection of EPA's cost estimation models and their approaches. But if we look at the compliance costs, the medium estimates for our sample based here in Ohio is that large systems you'd expect about $235 per year and small systems about eight hundred and fifty dollars per year. And so, if you combine those together, compare them to the median household incomes, what we see is that all of these large systems have their financial capability below two point five percent median household income, and a large portion of the small systems have their financial capability metric above two point five percent. Which means that small systems may lack the financial capability to comply with the PFAS standard. And from a technology perspective, that could be particularly concerning. Um, because what this means is there exists some maximum bound on how much a treatment technology can cost. And we can use this policy information to inform technoeconomic assessment for and technology evaluation for water treatment technologies. So for instance, we can say that for the smallest systems, this is less than $300,000 per year per system. And that's going to be your debt financing, so paying off the capital cost, your annual operating costs, labor costs, everything has to be less than $300,000 per year for small water systems. This also has implications for the design of regulations because if a system is unable to comply or it does not have the financial resources to comply using a centralized treatment technology, the Safe Drinking Water Act creates what are known as variances. And we might need to start to consider using variances for PFAS regulations. The issue is that this is untested territory for the Safe Drinking Water Act. We've never had issue variances before. And so we don't know what that will look like. We don't know how states will need to respond in order to meet this. So this is a, can be an advanced warning that we need to start to think about variances seriously. 
This also means that if a system is given a variance by the state, that they still have to treat water, they just do it at the point of use. They do it in individual households. They give everyone an understand filter or some other technology. And we also need to start developing technologies that are going to be low maintenance and can be used for point of use applications. And so that is the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, as a quick reminder, we found or I showed how the 1990 Clean Act amendments led to an increase in the amount of trace element engine power plants in the wastewater or leaving power plants in the wastewater. Um, that this variability in the wastewater might justify differentiating the Clean Water Act regulations, and that small and very small water systems might lack the financial capability to pay for compliance with future potential PFAS regulations. And kind of going back to where I started thinking about what are the data challenges and data gaps when we're thinking about water regulations, I talked about how there's this lack of data, especially real time data, on compounds of interest in water, that water is highly variable across and even within close geographic regions. And it can be challenging to assess the costs of water treatment. And I showed how trace element models like the power plant pulse controls model can be used to predict wastewater concentrations, how these models can have statistically significant differences and a potential need for differentiated regulations, and how models can have technology costs, as well as potential needs for new approaches to regulations. And to kind of, so this is kind of what I've talked about today. Um, just as a high level overview, this is part of how I put problems and part of what my lab works on. Um, we are open engineering, but I think about my work falling into three different broad buckets. There's a processes bucket, a policies bucket, and a people bucket. And sort of processes, which is what I talk a lot about today, is just understanding and evaluating technological processes that society will need in the future for sustainable and resilient water and energy infrastructure systems. And we build up these techno-economic assessment and life cycle assessment and optimization models in order to inform policies. And these are the two that I was focusing the most on, is understanding how processes and policies interact. Also some stuff I'm not going to talk about today, but I'm happy to talk about offline in terms of thinking about how people make decisions now people value infrastructure decisions. And so what we do in my lab is, oh, sorry, slides went too fast. Um, think about the interactions between these three buckets and how engineering models can inform policy analysis, policy evaluation, and inform and educate people. Um, this is kind of consistent with the grand challenges we have in environmental engineering, particularly grand challenge number five, around informing decisions in engineering infrastructure. But I'm going to skip over some stuff. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead, throw out my acknowledgement slides. I want to thank for the Coles Controls work. Um, my co authors for that, which is Megan Mauder and Yifan Zhao, as well as our funding source, the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, and the Oak Ridge Institute for Science Education Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the work on financial capability of drinking water systems. The undergraduate students who helped me collect that data, Jacob Garner, right over there, as well as Jack Cariello, who is online. And the funding for that so far comes from the Ohio State um, through my startup funds. And with that, I will open up the floor for questions. Would you like as well? Um, stopping screen sharing might help just if anyone would wish to. Set that. So I know how to end the screen sharing. <laughs> Start. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. This mm -hmm. was, in, in particular, kind of finishing up and giving kind of the sense of how these all interact. So, my, my question actually is about interaction in, in spatial location in terms of testing and thinking about variances and, and, and modeling. Uh, how important are the spatial uh, relationships among, say, the, the, the water facilities? And um, is that something we should be concerned about? It's about the accumulation of Yes. Um, so thinking about it from like the power plant perspective, there there are substantial questions around kind of communities that are looking at power plants. We know that especially coal-fired power plants tend to be located around communities um, that have or that have historically been disadvantaged in terms of our locations. Um, so there's always environmental justice concerns around pollution and potentially loosening pollution regulations. Um, I think, and so that, that is a very valid and very important concern. Um, however, it is not necessarily the case 
a priori that tightening regulations is going to be an environmental justice benefit to these communities. I think, again, kind of thinking about more intense treatment processes require more energy and more um, chemical feedback, feedstocks. And so some there's uh, there might be some trade-offs between um, air quality protections and environmental quality protections. And when you do the benefit cost analysis work on the affluent limitation guidelines and what the EPA proposed in this space, um, what you see is that the air quality costs of additional treatment or like including things in the life cycle like chemicals, which occur far away from the power plant, um, may outweigh the benefits of improved water quality, in part because this improved water quality is things like, it's, a, it's I don't want to, uh, it's not necessarily human health impacts for water quality. It's much more, you have more wild fowl that can survive in the water, which has kind of substantively less uh, value in benefit cost analysis calculations than human health impacts from increased air pollution. And so there are these trade-offs that we need to think about and grapple with. And not always just assume that over-treatment is, or over design is an appropriate response to be protective of human health. I'm happy to share some of the analysis we did on, on that benefit cost analysis. It's actually it's really fun work. And then, then I assume there are all sorts of inter inter jurisdictional issues with the, the cost being borne in, in one place and the benefits being borne somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a consistent question around environmental policy, especially um, with, with air sheds, water sheds, with life cycle implications as well. It, it, gets, it gets tricky. Um, and that's, I think, part of why the EPA is obviously involved in this, that was just within a single state. The EPA couldn't do much. Um, their power comes from interstate. Yeah, they, these are a challenge. Um, so I don't know if there's a good answer to like, how do we fix this? How do we fix the fundamental problem of federalism right. in the environmental space? Let's see in chat, I don't know if that's a question. And I'll just say that then. Okay. I don't know if I'm conceptualizing this correctly, so bear with me, but. Um, do you know if there's been any thought on, I remember the standard of the EPA, or like at least the, the sort of figure of current income plus like the cost over median household income, it was less than 2.5%. Mm -hmm. uh, part of what like came to mind as well was that means there's gonna be less of a push for improvement, especially in communities where like, they're already like poor, like they have weaker socioeconomic conditions to bear additional costs, but at the same time, those with the communities, we want more attention paid to begin with. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's any attention being paid to both from the EPA or outside to actually bring in funds or whether that's a viable thing to focus? So the, the EPA does have kind of substantial investment in infrastructure systems that they can put in place. So for instance, we have state level drinking water quality funds, um, which are they're either low or no interest cost loans to systems. Um, and so that can help kind of reduce the cost of capital and supply it um, so that these communities that may have limited access to it can comply with regulations um, and can access these tools. So that funding mechanism does exist. Um, there are kind of potentially bigger and more, there are bigger questions around like, is that 2.5 metric an appropriate one? We can talk about how the EPA came up with that number, uh, maybe offline. Uh, it's not the most defensible number, um, but there's a number. Um, but you also, if you have this kind of total water cost, you also run into questions around like, at some point, we will eat up what we've been calling the regulatory slack or the regulatory budget, which is that a household can only apply 2.5% of their income towards it. But what if we discover some brand new chemical once the household water costs are already 2.5% that we really need to regulate? Well, what does that mean then? Um, is, does that mean that we need to like uninstall technologies that can install new technologies? And there's all sorts of questions around like what happens when we hit that number um, that the EPA is grappling with. Um, there's been a lot of work in kind of thinking about that affordability metric, especially in the, the mid 2000s to early 20 teens, shortly after our state. So it's complicated. My students, they, they never get asked the questions. <laughs> I'm the spot here. We'll go with Noah and then Diego. So my question was 
more relating to like the first two case studies about the coal fired power plants. Um, does looking into like coal fired power plants potentially decommissioning for or their lifetime um, is like complete or like the general shift away from coal power? Is that ever like included in any of your modeling for like the cost of adding new regulatory um, technologies in those plants? So trying to remember uh so as far as like just the, the overall fit and transport stuff the like behavior um i have not done a quantitative analysis about how plant retirement is expected to impact um what kind of are qualitative looking at who is retiring which plants are retiring early they tend to be older plants and older plants are less likely to have uh fluid acid stabilization systems so what we'd see, we will, kind of what we might naively expect is that overall as more plants retire, um, the overall mass might end up falling down of these plants and these processes. But at the same time, the kind of the rate or the percent of the, the selenium, the arsenic, the migrate that ends up in the wastewater might increase over the total percentage. But that remains um, because the plants that stay on are those that have the best desulfurization systems that partition, which is elements two. The wastewater. Um, for the, the benefit cost analysis and the regulatory work, we've done some analysis in part because that was a key benefit for regulations on wastewater is actually the reduction of coal on the margins. Um, so you have less coal fired power plants generating, you have less air pollution as a result, therefore, you have human health benefits. Um, when you take, for instance, some of the overtreatment questions, um, the, the benefits of shifting away from coal are actually are still smaller than the environmental consequences of having to overtreat treat water basically to eliminate the discharge of pollutants in the environment, um, which is the strictest standard that we can go with, and one that we're that we still are actively considering. Um, so the, the shifting as much isn't doesn't factor that as much. And um, I think that's all the uh, prospective analysis uh, on comparing like um, how operational parameters of power plants uh, can affect the uh, per the environmental performance of uh, the emissions. I mean, uh, you uh, model like existing existing power plants and perform this uh, analysis on existing power plants. Uh, do you uh, play with different parameters to check like the sensitivity? And uh, how um, can be like the future of, of, of power plants and regulation of emissions? So, we've not done perspective analysis on the resettlement flows um, in part um, because the, the recent question we were interested in was a retrospective one. It was understanding what is the impact of the 1990 and um, If you have, which probably would not be too difficult given some of the data, I know some of the modeling, you could start to integrate our resettlement flow estimates with capacity models and capacity dispatch planning models to understand like which plants are, are likely to stay in place and which ones are likely to retire earlier. You can use kind of published and announced retirements in order to do some perspective analysis when we have that back up. And I have another question about those uh, the ghost ones. Um, do you consider different points of operation of the plant? Like um I that the some of the graphs that you presented the CDS are a, a you are presenting the um, and even with uncertainty, the, the different uh, the whole spectrum of the plants. Um, but um, what is the operational point that you are? When you say operational point, do you mean like where in the power plant? Where where the power plant? So uh, all the wastewater CDS were the influence of the power plants. Um, so what is entering the wastewater treatment system? What is leaving the fluid acid supplementation system entering wastewater? Um, in part because there is, while we have good data on what the treatment technology in the air side, we have no idea really what power plants is on the wastewater side. So we can't promulgate kind of in pure analysis past that point to think about um, how water and what kind of the effluent wastewater might look like. Um, this is one of the big data gaps in power plant water analysis. So we don't have that. In the chat, and I apologize if I pronounced this incorrectly, Shui Kao asks or says, Thank you for your impressive presentation, Dr. Hubert. I have a question. Wastewater discharges from upstream to downstream, for example, often straddle jurisdictional areas. Are the models able to resolve how many percentages of the wastewater should be attributable to each jurisdiction? 
No, so we're not doing any phantom transport. We are saying this is this is technically not even what is leaving the plant. This is what is entering the treatment system at a, at a power plant. Um, because again, as I just mentioned, we don't have data on what power plant is installed. Um, and then the phantom transport question is its own kind of um, tricky, like how do you account for trace elements that might absorb on to the sediment and so kind of fall out of the water chemistry as it were. Um, if we could model the, um, if we had good data on treatment technologies and the discharge points for facilities, we can start to think about attributing just overall loading to um, particular locations, but it would be very difficult to then carry that on down the river to say a further point downstream, say where it crosses a county or a state line. Uh, since if that's the last question, if anyone has any final questions, feel free to unmute. Gotcha. Barring that, I think Dr. Greenbaum, if you want to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you very much for entertaining. Uh, everybody, the, the next colloquium will be two weeks from today on March 21st. Dr. Rhodesia McMillan from the College of Education and Human Ecology uh, will be joining us. All of the details are now up on the, the Glenn website and the events part of the website. It's kind of a new feature that we're populating that. So you can go to that part of our website to see the details. And we hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank, Thank you.